Hamilton, we want to take you to city, Savannah City Hall this morning where Mayor Van Johnson is giving his weekly update on the city's fight against the coronavirus. Let's listen in. Today's mask is brought to you by the city of Savannah. Somebody made this for me. It's the city of Savannah, so it's cool. Good morning, and thank you for joining me today as we continue our fight, our mission against COVID-19. Savannah's emergency declaration mandating the wearing of masks in the public space remains in effect, and teams of city employees are enforcing this mandate and will do so until further notice. Chatham County's seven-day rolling average of new cases is about 128 after peaking on Friday at nearly 137. Remember, the number we needed to go back to phase two was six, and our high on Friday was 137. One month ago, the seven-day average was about 45 cases, and two months ago, it was just 10. More than 150 people are still hospitalized in Chatham County with COVID-19. This number has remained steady for the last two weeks and we keep them in our thoughts and in our prayers. Our positive test percentage has dropped slightly, which is good news, but please keep in mind that the most recent data available is based on tests from two weeks ago. Since the start of this pandemic, 68 employees, Savannah team members, have tested positive for COVID-19 including 38 police officers and seven firefighters. Currently, 24 City of Savannah employees remain positive, including seven police officers. The Coastal Health District is extending testing hours at the Savannah Civic Center. Free COVID-19 testing is now available from 8.30 a.m to 3.30 p.m. Monday through Friday. Walk-up testing will begin at 8.30 and drive-through testing starts around 9.30. You can also get tested at the Savannah Civic Center on Saturday, August the 1st and Saturday, August the 22nd from 8.30 a.m. until 11.30 a.m. Thanks to the city's partnership with New York State, we were able to test 1,295 people in five days at the Kingdom Life Christian Fellowship Church. And we are grateful to Pastor Charles Robeson and the Kingdom Life family for their hospitality and their assistance. Tomorrow, free testing will be available at the Temple of Glory Community Church at 1105 South Avenue in the Carver Village community. You can get tested Wednesday through Saturday from 9 a.m. to 5 o'clock p.m. We're encouraging people to go ahead and make an appointment to be tested at the Temple of Glory by calling 833-697-4728. 833-697-4728. SOMOS Community Care and Northwell Health of New York are staffing the sites. We are and remain grateful that these health heroes are here on the ground in Savannah, lending us their resources and expertise. And we are grateful to Savannians for showing our guests good old Southern hospitality, because that's what we do. This week, Savannah was home to another kind of COVID-19 testing. The world's biggest, largest, and greatest 
COVID-19 vaccine study got underway yesterday right here in Savannah. And as I understand it, one of our own, WTOC Don Baker, was the first in the country to receive this vaccine. That's just kind of how Don is. Savannah's site was the first to start vaccinations and is one of more than seven dozen trial sites scattered across the country. 30,000 planned volunteers are helping to test shots created by the National Institutes of Health and Moderna Incorporated. We are grateful to the scientists and the healthcare professionals working diligently to find a long-term solution to and hopefully a cure for COVID-19. Today, at 1 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time, I will be participating in a press briefing with the National League of Cities and the U.S. Conference of Mayors on behalf of cities across the nation regarding the latest negotiations from Congress for the fourth stimulus package. The GOP bill released does not have direct funding to cities, which has a direct and dire impact on cities across the country, like Savannah, who are still responsible for providing direct services, but are faced with devastating losses in our main sources of revenue. In Savannah's case, lost sales, lost hotel and motel taxes that cannot be recovered. In city news, we will begin the first round of interviews of candidates aspiring to be Savannah's next city manager next week. We look forward to sharing more information about the candidates as we are allowed by law when we identify the top candidates, top finalists. We have narrowed this list down to six to interview in the first round. We could decide to move forward with the six. We could choose to go back to the over 100 applications received. So right now, this is still a very, very fluid process. Last Thursday, the Savannah City Council approved necessary amendments in our existing non-discrimination ordinance. We are determined to do all that we can to ensure that Savannah is not a place where discrimination is tolerated for any reason. I thank the City Council, I thank Proud Savannah and Team Savannah for taking a big step forward in making Savannah the beloved community we know it all we all know that it can be. We still need you to complete your 2020 census. We have hit almost 52% participation in Savannah, which still lags behind similarly situated cities in our region. Savannah, we got to do better. We have to lead and we need people to complete their census. We're trying to get as many people as possible to fill it out online, by mail, or over the phone by the end of the month, which is Friday. So please help us get the word out. Hospitals, schools, and housing programs are just a few examples of organizations that depend on census for funding to help our community. An accurate count of everyone living in Savannah makes sure we have what we need and more importantly, we have what we deserve. I remind everyone that your information is secure and your responses are essential, essential for Savannah's future success. There are two things you can do. One is to complete the census and the second is vote. And we're asking everyone to make sure that they are engaged in early voting as best as possible to try to alleviate and avoid some of the issues we had during the last voting cycle. These are runoff elections. They are still very, very important. And I can tell you 
as a survivor of a runoff election, how important uh, runoff elections are. So we're asking people to go out and make sure your voices are heard in these runoff elections. And finally, well, almost finally, I ask that you join me on this Thursday, okay, this Thursday at 10 o'clock a.m. when I introduce our Housing Savannah Task Force, which will lead us in developing an affordable housing policy that will ensure that Savannians can afford to live in Savannah and that Savannah does not become too expensive for Savannians. This is a huge uh, part of our work in not only poverty reduction, but also economic strength. And so we're asking for you to join us as we introduce our task force. And as you may remember, the city council took a huge step in that direction last week when we declared the uh, former property maintenance property on Drayton Street and surplus, and we'll be seeking to build mixed use housing on this very strategic location. You know the um, property is on Drayton Street. It is blocks away from the health department, blocks away from Forsyth Park, blocks from downtown, very strategic location. It's a great opportunity and I thank uh, city manager and team Savannah for helping us to, um, to consider options and get to where we need to be. So that ends my prepared remarks and I will be more than willing to answer any questions you may have. <clears throat> we, we figured we go hard, we go the hardest first. Well, I think we have to call it for what it is. Um, the, the bill is a GOP bill. Um, our concern is, and, and in this case, see, we have to replace mics that you drop. <laughs> no, it's fine. Yeah, for, right. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, today speaking on behalf of cities across the country, as I will be doing this afternoon, the issue is real for us. Um, if I just look at our personal example, um, our city manager will tell you that we derive our income really from four different sources. Property taxes, sales tax, hotel motel tax, and franchising fees. So property taxes, of course, valuation changes here and there. But that's sales tax. For us, which is our busiest time of the year, if businesses are not operating at 100% capacity, uh, the fact is the money is not coming in. Not only for the city of Savannah, but for other people who receive that. If people are not staying in hotels, then we're not getting a hotel motel sales tax. Well, the question becomes for us is how do you replace that income? And the fact is, there's really no place to do it. Um, I'm really fortunate and, and blessed that Team Savannah has done everything they have come done to be able, in the midst of a very um, a very questionable time to be able to do everything they could that A, that we would be able to maintain service levels as best we can. And again, I know, and I'll say, put the elephant in the room, I know some of our trash pickups have been slow, um, but we're also social distancing. But the fact is, we are providing the service. Um, we still have police officers in the street, we still have firefighters fighting fires, we still have um, staff members doing all the wonderful things they do every day. But the fact is, the money has to come to pay for it. And we've tried all we could not to be able to furlough an employee, not to lay off an employee, because we realize there's an effect to that too. They're also citizens. Um, but in the meantime, um, we can't always do that, um, which is part of the reason why we're recommending maintaining the, um, the rate for our, um, our millage rate for that very, very reason, because we're already losing money and we can't continue to lose money. So, um, people think the federal government's money is the federal government's money. No, the federal government's money is also our money. 
And so in this late, latest iteration, they included educational institutions, they forgot about cities. And the fact is the uh, rubber meets the road at cities. And so for us, it's important that cities are included. Uh, I believe, Mr. Manager, 13.2 million. And again, it has to come from somewhere. I mean, you think about it. If you you lost your job and you have, you know, your bills are still due, your bills, your obligations are still the same. And so, how do you close that gap? And so, um, I'm absolutely against raising property tax, um, so to speak. Um, I certainly don't want to impact our service levels by affecting our employees. So then again, how do we fill that gap? It is only but so much you can cut. How will you fill it? Well, that is what the city manager talked to council about uh, during our last meeting. Um, I think the first thing is to make sure that we don't adopt the rollback rate, that we maintain our millage rate as it is. That closes the gap somewhat. Um, and again, the city manager and the budget team have already instituted a variety of, of stopgap options. Um, there are a lot of things the city does that we have not done. Um, to help to slow the gap down. But ultimately, um, we're going to need that federal assistance. Thank God Savannah is not as bad as some cities who've already done layoffs, who've already done furloughs. Um, and, you know, we're not there yet. But, um, you know, certainly uh, we cannot continue this way and not have some type of infusion of cash to help us. It's 13.2 million. That's not the end of it, right? No, I mean, every day it grows. I mean, it continues to grow. This is a projected amount, and this is just in our general fund, correct? This does not include our other enterprise funds, our parking, sanitation, and things that could also run deficits. We're just talking about our general fund at this point. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I won't say that they have leveled off. I think I've, we've witnessed kind of um, an increase at a less, uh, a, a less, uh, not as quickly, but we're still increasing, if that makes any sense. Um, I think that it also shows us we, we had um, four deaths um, that were been reported yesterday uh, in Chatham County. There were seven for the Coastal Health District. Um, so again, this is still a very uh, dangerous and very precarious situation that we find ourselves in. Uh, for, for the city of Savannah, as far as we're concerned, we continue to follow the science. Uh, we remain in contact with our, our health district, um, and should we get a recommendation, or should we get the thought that we're there yet, again, we want to make that a last resort, and we have been resisting uh, people saying, shut it down, shut it down, because they don't really recognize what shut it down means. Well, shut it down means that we have um, really eliminated all other options. Um, if we look at it in a historical sense, we are worse now than we were when we had to stay at home order. And so we're trying to work um, in lockstep with the health department, uh, with the state, uh, to be able to, to address uh, those issues. Um, the conversation right now that we continue to monitor and watch. And I know, kind of like you said, everyone has their own opinion, especially on social media, one way or the other. No one's ever happy. Everybody on social media are now infectious disease um, experts and epidemiologists. I mean, I, I mean, I've been amazed. Um, I, you know, I realize what my limitations are, um, and I'm not on that well in biology, but I do understand that you listen to experts. So if people have come and said, "Well, no." They showed us this, and they showed us that, they showed us this. Again, I think Savannah's relative success is being able that we talk to and engage with on a regular basis, in our case, a couple of times a day with, with our local health professionals um, that understand this for what it is. And so, um, you know, we're, that's our horse, and we're going to continue to ride that horse. How do you balance, um, you know, when things, if we get bad, you need to shut them down versus, you know, like you're saying, 
Well, then that's, the, that's really what the issue is. Um, as a city, we have to see both. You know, we, we cannot just see one side of the equation. We could shut down every business in the city. Well, what does that mean for our city? Well, that means that businesses are not operating. That means employees are not getting paid. It means that some businesses will not survive, which means some employees don't have jobs anymore. If I'm an employee that don't have a job anymore, my rent is still due. My mortgage is still due. Well, I'm not able to pay that anymore. So it becomes this kind of um, um, domino effect that occurs. And so for us, we want to make sure that if we do it, it's something we absolutely have to do. Because again, for us, the other side of it is there is a, there's, there's a, a health death and there's an economic death. And, you know, we just have to, we have to balance both of them. And so we have erred consistently um, during this on the side of caution, and we want to continue to do that. We don't want to do knee-jerk reactions. We don't want to be emotional. We don't want to go off perceptions or what somebody says on social media. We want to do it based on the science. Well, we also through GMA, we, we, the Georgia Municipal Association, we are also sending letters on behalf of Georgia cities to um, our senators. And so we're at Purdue and Loeffler, and we're asking them as well to represent us. Um, understand that Georgia has 538 some odd cities here, and we're feeling the brunt of this as well. And we're asking Washington to give us direct aid to be able to address the needs that we have. Again, Savannah is better off than many cities in our state. Um, I, I attribute that again to spectacular leadership and phenomenal planning on behalf of, of our team. But on the other end of it, even in the best case scenario, we cannot last like this forever. Um, and so um, we, we, we know we need help. We're not asking for a handout. We're asking for a return on the investment we make to our federal government to help us make it through this. Good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. Uh, is this the last question? You had another question, right? Oh, how are you feeling today, Sean? You want to be last? Or? I'll be last. Okay. Clean shaven, Sean, at that, but go ahead. Um, people on the street. Um, you will see, if you haven't already, a much more pronounced um, enforcement uh, of this. Uh, from what I've seen, it seems like uh, our citizens are getting it. It seems like our visitors may not be. And so we recognize we have to be more aggressive in this. Um, we're engaging other employees into this effort um, because we realize it does not also have to be, always have to be a law enforcement response. We have employees that are uh, empowered uh, by the city to um, issue tickets, issue summonses, um, and so you know all of them will have on uniforms, but they'll be on the streets um, again, um, enforcing our, our um, mass mandate. So, so a city employee can issue a ticket. Properly deputized people, if they're deputized as a city marshal, they can. How many are deputized? Um, I don't. 25? Yeah. 25 I, I do not know. But um, I, I, I want to make sure that people are very clear. Um, we've tried very hard not to be punitive about it. Um, we do recognize that some people are not taking it seriously. And so our efforts will be continuing. And we recognize sometimes people don't learn until they receive a ticket that, that, that we're serious. And so we'll continue to um, be, be politely aggressive um, in making sure that people are wearing masks. We know masks um, to slow the spread of COVID-19. Okay, this is the last one. What, what kind of a candidate or questions are you asking the city manager candidates? It's a very tenuous time to become a city manager. What are you looking for in a candidate during COVID-19? 
the questions I would ask? Well, I think, I think I'm, I'm, I'm looking for someone, personally, that not only has a demonstrated track record in leading cities. I think, for me, it's very important um, to, to find a gamer, so to speak, to find someone who has demonstrated experience of leading a city or, or county, um, someone who has been able to address some of the unique issues Savannah has faced. I want someone who loves people um, and is committed to people doing better. I, I want someone who is who understands the role of business, the role of a diversified economy, um, someone who is looking to get in and make things better, someone who's going to be dedicated to leaving Savannah better than they found it. Um, and so my, my question is, you know, do, do you love folks? Show me how you love people. Show me how you've been concerned about them, whether they have a PhD or no D at all. Show me how you've treated people, whether they came from the White House or they have no house. Uh, I, I mean, for me, it's about um, not only the management side of it, about how do you treat uh, employees, but also on the people side of it. How do you treat those constituents and those that you serve? For me, that's the most important thing, and I'm interested in not about ideas, but I really want to see a demonstrated track record of someone who has been able to address some of the unique issues we face here in Savannah um, in other places. I want to be able to see it. Show me how you've done that. I knew you would come across with a hard question, so thank you, Joanne. <laughs> yes, sir. Logan, um, I do want to touch on just the clarity. I know you said that uh, right now you're weighing the options that the city might have for any potential shutdowns in the future if things don't get better, um, and that uh, that communication is happening. But have we eliminated those options? What will that look like when those options are gone, to where you'll have to make those decisions? Well, again, I think that um, it, 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 the, the two sides to it. The first side is the community side the city the city as um the city as a jurisdictional territory how do we address it as a city externally and then the second part is how we handle it as a city internally um, again i refer you to the the great presentation last thursday from our budget team um, that dealt with what our options are um, and i will tell you that for us um, the city manager is charged with putting all options on the table. And among those options is, um, is a tax increase. Among those options are, are furloughs or laying off of employees. Um, I'll go back to, to furloughs, furloughs of every single uh, city employee to include members of council. Um, I think, um, you know, again, a, a variety of things. Um, and they've laid it out, I believe, in five tiers, um, a different five based on those escalating circumstances. On the community side, on the jurisdictional territory side, it really deals about how, what is the impact? And for us, we have to be able to act with the end game in mind. We have to be able to um, look at it um, very strategically. Um, look at how many people will be affected, understanding that shutting the city down also could mean, uh, and it very likely will mean, that some businesses will not survive it. And so for us, the question is, um, is that acceptable collateral damage for us? Which is why we've been hesitant, because again, the answer would be, well, no, we want everybody to be able to survive. And so to me, that's why it's so easy just to say, you know what, if we don't want to be inconvenienced, just wear a doggone mask. I mean, we know that this, um, we know that wearing masks helps slow the spread. Um, that is among the things our governor is asking us to do. Wear a mask. We're just saying it's important enough, we're mandating you for to wear a mask. We know that if everybody does that over, um, I believe, four to six weeks or so, we will be in a position where we would have slowed the spread sufficiently where we could dial back masks. 
But again, if people want to just do what they want to do, um, you know, I'm, my, my position is don't cry when you see what the results are. Some of these same businesses that will say, well, you know, we don't want to enforce it, we don't want to do all that, but it's their livelihoods that are at stake. If you're not going to do it because you care about citizens, do it because you care about yourself. Because a, a citywide shutdown is a citywide shutdown. And we have some cities, as I understand it, uh, from some of my colleagues across the straight state, are looking at dialing back um, bars, um, you know, closing times. Uh, for Savannah, that is huge. But I will tell you, um, that that's on the table for me. If we cannot do it voluntarily, we will, we will mandate that people do it. And I do not want to go there. But, you know, it is what it is. We need people to wear a mask. Thank you, sir. And also, you mentioned testing sites, the success, the numbers that have gone through. Last week, the other side of the this week, that the um, numbers that have gone through this week. What have you gleaned so far from how some of us in North will operate to where we'll be able to stand these up on our own around the city to where they're just doing Well, and thank you for that question. Um, I've been, and for people who have criticized, our partnership with New York, they forget that we've had 20 people on the ground um, last week and through uh, the rest of this week. Um, SOMOS, Community Care, and Northwell are well all machines. I mean, they know what they're doing and they got in there and they did it. I mean, bam, bam, bam. So you talk about 1,295 um, tests over five days, we're talking about you know, maybe near a little less than 300 a day um, is, is pretty good. And that was keeping in mind with the fact that we were still doing testing downtown. And in this case, and I was there um, a couple of days during the week, people were able to walk up. More importantly, people were walking up from the apartment complexes on Middle Ground Road. They were walking up from various places around those communities. They were coming. Um, into a place they knew and trusted as opposed to coming uh, downtown um, where it was a little more inconvenient. And, and so for us, we, we recognize that in-community testing works. It just works. Um, it's effective. Um, to the other end of it, I think we've also learned that the backlog is still in results. Um, we have uh, labs that are overwhelmed and we can test, but people really need to have those results back within a reasonable period of time. And so for that, we are working through how that happens, keeping in mind we don't control that side of it. But we need to have ways that we're able to provide reliable test results in a relatively short period of time. Um, to that end, beyond that, um, we recognize still that the contract tracing um, has to be accelerated um, because if I am if I'm positive, and I don't know till nine days later, but I've been going around people for nine days, then I have affected more people. So we have to be able to condense that. Um, you know, but I think for us, the partnership with New York, the partnership with Somos and Northwell have been a blessing for us. And I think for us, it allows the community to have some conversation. Um, we know this works. We know working with the faith community works. You know, in this case, remember now, we're doing indoor testing. Um, so let's take the same template, let's look at other places by data that are hot spots, and let's drop this operation in here, and let's try to get this done. And I want to be able to just let you know, of course, the tests that were provided to us were provided to us free of charge from the state of New York. So again, this was stuff we were not paying for. We're not paying for these individuals um, or their time. We're not paying for the tests that were going on um, and you know I, th I think you know we're, we're feeding the folks and so I think that's what that host should do um, so our cost in relation to what we received um, 165,000 pieces of PPE I think it's minimal compared to what we got out the partnership. Do we see like the city center other city facilities that be offered up in these hot spot areas around the city community centers any other city on property? I do I, I, I think again um, we, we've been um, Looking at this very closely, my, my, my chief deputy assistant um, has been on the ground with them daily, kind of looking at what lessons we can learn, what lessons we can glean from this that we can now apply to other testing. And so, um, 
you know, I think we can ultimately create a, a, a kind of a paratrooper situation where we can drop a testing operation in the middle of a community and test. But again, it doesn't mean much if we're not getting the results back in a timely manner. It doesn't mean much if we're not able to do the contract tracing quickly. So again, we're going to continue to be in partnership with our health partners to do all we can to help that to happen. So you're doing a Joanne on me. It is uh, actually with regards to your, your social media platform. Yeah. There was a publication online uh, last week that mentioned there's a second federal lawsuit that's been filed against you regarding the access citizens have to your Facebook page. Yes. Do you agree with that assessment that people have a right because you conduct city business? on that page to comment and not be blocked for what they're saying? Or what caused them to be blocked in the first place? Well, I think there's a couple of things. I think that the federal case that cited was not in this district. So I think that's the first thing. The, pre the presupposition is, is that it applies to all that could happen in one. Um, it has not occurred in this district. My position is this. I maintain a very active, um, social media presence. Um, last told about 30,000 people um, tune in to my social media professional page um, to see what the city is up to. I use it as a source of information, a sense of guidance, and I use it as an opportunity to be able to connect with our citizens. The two individuals who file the lawsuits do not live in Savannah don't live anywhere near Savannah. Um, they're trolls. And that's just what they do. My position has been, I don't mind people coming on my page to disagree with me. I don't have you know, thin skin like that. You can disagree with me. My position is, is that you will disagree in a respectful way. I will not tolerate profanity on my page, um, unless I'm using it. <laughs> I will not tolerate disrespect of people on my page. I won't tolerate disrespect of me on my page. If you go there, you're subject to being blocked. And so um, for those who've done it, they were blocked. As a part of the settlement, they were unblocked. If they go there again, they will be blocked again. Um, you know, what they're not gonna do is come on my page and disrespect any of my constituents or disrespect me. The thought of the, the, the way that the, the federal case on the other side was that they thought of social media presences, presence as like a town square, that people could come in and interact with their government. And my position um, is simply this. If the city council is meeting in this room, I would not allow anyone to come to that podium and disrespect myself or any member of city council. Sergeant Gray will escort them out of here. See, I mean, I don't think you, you have the right to be heard, you don't have the right to be disrespectful. And so my position almost goes with that with the city of Savannah's page as well. Um, I, you would just love to hear some of the things that people have said to me. Some of the names I've been called um, by people, some that don't even exist. And we block those because we recognize that these are people that are using um, alternate egos just to be able to get in and say crap that they want to be able to say. So to answer your question, um, we believe in the First Amendment. Um, you have the right to, to speak. I don't have the responsibility to hear your profane um, words or to tolerate your disrespect. So the, the word to the wise is, um, if they want to be civil and civilly disagree, um, they can do that on my page. If they, if they go there, try to go left, they'll find themselves blocked again. And so for commercial purposes, that page is at Mayor Johnson SAB. Mayor Johnson SOB, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. I don't know how to use Snapchat, but uh, Mayor Johnson SAB.
Thank you. Go ahead, Joanne. I, I knew you had. I, I was waiting. As I understand it, there was a softball tournament here in the city of Savannah. Um, we have pulled all the city-sponsored activities. The parks are still open. Um, we expect that if they're going to have their um, activities or people want to use the parks for those activities, that they have to follow the guidelines that are set forth by the Department of Health and by the governor's order. Pardon? It was a city. It's, well, City Park is a public park. Okay. Yeah. So it, it was, a, as I understand, it was a city softball field. Again, this was not city sponsored. Um, and the folks that came there played at their own risk, um, as anybody does there. Again, there are expectations as to um, how they should conduct themselves, how they social distance themselves. Um, and if they are found not to do that, then there are ramifications under the governor's order um, that uh, they would have to face. There are consequences to that. Okay. Are you aware of anybody out there trying to enforce the governor's order? Um, we, we do, as we, do as, as we see it. Um, as we see it or as we're alerted to it. Um, again, I think the other interesting thing is that when people um, are upset about what happens is um, in, in the field of law enforcement, the officer has to witness the behavior. So if, and I mean, let's be truthful. I mean, people up here, I mean, I know I've walked down um, um, Bates River Street with um, members of our team, sometimes police officers, and when they're a police officer there, first thing they do, they'll see us way before we see them. Now, when they pass us, they'll do this. But don't you see them doing that? Well, when we see them, they have the mask on. And so that has been, you know, some of our challenges, which is why we're going to go to um, some more creative ways. Um, people who are not wearing Savannah police uniforms um, to be able to help us to enforce it. That's it. Well, we, we appreciate you all for um, what you do, what you do for us, continuing to help us to spread the message. Um, you know, <clears throat> we're still facing some very dire times, some very strange times, some very interesting times. Um, I'm hoping and praying for us that we get to a point where we speak on a united voice about the things that are important, that our federal government, our state government, um, our municipal governments are able to agree on something um, I think that we have agreed now that 30 states have uh, now mandated masks. Uh, every day um, this week, I believe another state is, is adding to the list. I still hope and pray that Georgia joins that list um, and let us speak as a united community that we agree on a couple of things. A, that COVID can be beat. B, that there are ways to beat COVID. See that wearing masks, social distancing, and washing your hands um, is a key to that. And finally, that we commit as a community that we will endure temporary discomfort for long-term viability. Um, if we do those things, we're going to be able to look at coronavirus one day in the rearview mirror. I mean, I know our citizens are tired. I'm tired. Um, it is it's difficult. I mean, I want to talk about big dreams and goals for the city of Savannah. And every day we're sitting here fighting about COVID stuff. Um, I don't want to be in this position. Nobody wants to be in this position. But this is where we are. And we have to play the hand we've been dealt. The question is, is how are we going to play the hand? You could play to win. You could play to lose. In Savannah, we play to win. And with 
our citizens doing the right thing by us being Savannah strong and showing Savannah love. We have a hand of aces and we will win. God, may God bless you. May God continue to bless the city of Savannah. And y'all like my mask, right? right? And now back to your regularly scheduled television because people are upset about that.